Yeah, and the country's National Assembly has for the better part of the morning been debating on a report on persons nominated to be principal secretaries in various departments. Yesterday, the House approved all the seven nominees for appointment to the position of Cabinet Secretary. The House unanimously endorsed President Uhuru Kenyatta's nominees despite condemnation from a section of members that the list of nominees violated the constitutional provisions on the one-third gender rule, ethnic and uh, regional balance, and that nominees to the Cabinet shall not be members of parliament. Well, this afternoon, the National Assembly will be deliberating on the chairperson and members of the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. Let's take a look at the happenings that took place this morning. Region is just secondary. These are very qualified individuals, and uh, I think they deserve the position. Mr. Speaker, my recommendation on financial management is based on the fear that in Kenya, if you are a PS or you head a parastato that starts with the word national or Kenya, the possibility of going to the corruption courts are very high. So we are just urging the new PSs to take heed that the fight against corruption is now extremely serious and we don't want them to fall prey. So they should be given orientation on financial management. With those remarks, I beg to move. Very well. Honorable members, I am going to put the question and I'll start with the first one which is that this house adopts the report of the departmental committee on the administration and national security on the vetting of a person for appointment as principal secretary laid on the table of the house on Wednesday December 16 2015 and pursuant to the provisions of article 155 3b of the constitution approves the appointment of Mr. Mika Powon as the principal secretary, State Department for Corre Correctional Services. Will as many as of that opinion say aye? aye. As many as of that contrary opinion say nay? The ayes have it. I put the, the, the question also, which is that the House adopts the report of the Departmental Committee on Environment and Natural Resources on vetting of persons for appointment as principal secretaries laid on the table of the House on Wednesday, December 16, 2015, and pursuant to the provisions of Article 155.3b of the Constitution, approves the appointment of Charles Sunkuli, Mr. Charles Sunkuli, as principal secretary, State Department for Environment, and Dr. Margaret Mwakima, as principal secretary, State Department for Natural Resources. Will as many as of that opinion say aye? As many as of our contrary opinion say nay, the eyes have it. Right, and we now want to speak to our reporter Patrick Amimo, who has been uh, following the proceedings at uh, Parliament. And uh, Patrick, thank you very much for joining us. Maybe you can tell us what stood out uh, about uh, this morning's uh, proceedings in Parliament. And uh, thank you, Betty. It has been a marathon session uh, for members of the National Assembly since morning. So far, uh, from yesterday evening and today morning, they've already uh, approved 19 principal secretaries to their positions, respective positions. Uh, yesterday, we also had uh, at least seven cabinet secretaries. Uh, seven nominees to the cabinet secretary position approved by the National Assembly. So today, um, ten, ten, ten nominees for the different PS positions have been uh, have been approved by the National Assembly. Though among them we had uh, Nancy. Kari Githu, who had issues with uh, uh, at least uh, so, some reports, a petition had been brought uh, concerning uh, integrity, where some member claimed that uh, she was involved into irregular promotions and uh, trips of, of, of by a few members of uh, of the of a few members of staff at the Kenya Maritime Authority, where when, where she was serving as a director general. But um, the committee, in its report, says that it looked into these allegations and found them they were baseless, and also uh, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission uh, investigated the matter and said. Uh, there was no substantive case uh, on this particular matter. So the, uh, the ESCC had to uh, uh, clear Nancy Kirigithu out of these uh, of these allegations. Uh, the other person that um, uh, that I'm able to bring of note in this particular the PS is that uh, the principal secretary for transport will be the youngest uh, principal uh, will be the youngest PS at 33 years, uh, and that is. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Wilson Yakera Irungu is 33 year old. is the youngest principal secretary so far in, in this cabinet uh, of, of President Uhuru Kenyatta. Remember last week the president did appoint 24 members, new new members to be to join the cabinet uh, uh, to add to the 26 that he did appoint in uh, in 2013. So. 
once the vetting process will be done, we'll have an expanded cabinet of at least about 48 principal secretaries and 20, 20 cabinet secretaries. Uh, this, uh, this afternoon, we, we are waiting to see more vetting of at least the five remaining principal secretaries who will be vetted this afternoon. And also, in, together with the five principal secretaries who will be vetted this afternoon, we'll also be having the members of the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, led by the chairperson, Philip Kinisu, and the four members of the commission. The committee report has, has already that was done by the Justice and Legal Affairs Committee has given an okay to, to the nominees. Uh, all, all the five, uh, they say that there, there are no issues and they say they should be, they should be appointed to the positions. But with regard to, uh, there is one nominee uh, that is uh, Rose, uh, Rose Mugoi, Rose, Rose Mutambo Masharia. Uh, in the report, the committee notes that uh, Alego, uh, this MP, uh, the member Olago Aluocho post her uh, approval uh, based on the allegations that, uh, that touched on her integrity. The case that uh, when she was consulted, uh, when she was uh, um, given a consultancy service by the World Bank, uh, she f issued uh, false credentials. And that matter, it was said that uh, the World Bank was investigating the issue, but uh, so far, uh, uh, Rose, during when she appeared before the committee, said that she was not aware that the World Bank was being was investigating her, and she uh, they also the committee uh, dismissed those allegations, saying that uh, they were not on on oath they, they whoever made the allegations did not swear uh did not swear an oath so it could not uh, it could not hold so she was cleared of those allegations so apart from uh, olago loach who opposed the approval in the last sitting out of the 21 members who, who, who attended that particular meeting to approve the nominees to the ethics and anti-corruption commission it's only uh olago loach who had a, a dissenting view so the 20 members did endorse the membership of this uh, ethics and anti-corruption commission no you know very well that uh, the country the the way the ethics and anti-corruption commission is currently constituted uh, it is less it's, it's not having commissioners and um, people have questioned the legality of the commission as it is so the president is eager and with the, with the way the fight the, the, the war on corruption uh, as as it gains momentum it is it is uh, uh, important that uh, we have uh, a working commission in place i've read the committee's report on on philip kenusu who will be uh who has been uh, designated to be the chairperson of the committee of of the anti-corruption commission and the committee um, is very impressed with this uh, his presentation uh, during the during the vetting process, they say it was uh, it, it was um, equal to to, to issues uh, at at hand. And given that uh, they want to try him as uh, a hand, because given that he's from the private sector, they want to try and see whether he'll uh, he'll bring changes at the commission. Because the past the, the in the past uh, we had the commissioners in the past as uh, the ethics and anti corruption commission. Most of them have been uh, lawyers, and they have failed in one 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 area or the other. So the Justice and Legal Affairs Committee uh, they, does believe that uh, with the incoming of Philip Kinusu, who is coming from the private sector and an accountant uh, to boot, they think that uh, he, might, uh, he might turn around the commission and see at least uh, uh, this issue of a graft uh, 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 dealt with. We also have this an another another nominee who is, uh, who is a lawyer, uh, Gigishohi, and they also believe that with his legal uh, background in procurement, uh, where at least 70 percent of uh, corruption cases are, are, are said to be to, to be to, to be to be executed, I think with his background, the committee believes that uh, he'll give the necessary input to the to the anti-corruption commission and on the war on graft, especially now that uh, uh, the government is is uh, is keen to uh, to continue to continue with the fight so we will uh, we'll be expecting in the afternoon to see how the how the house goes about about about, is, uh, about this issue all the nominees no nobody has raised an issue on integrity issues about them save for rose mugoy which the ethics and anti-corruption commission investigated and said that uh, she was clean to be approved betty right thank you very much uh patrick Kamimo, for that detailed report on what has been happening in the uh parliament and of course what's going to be happening this afternoon they will be deliberating on the chairperson and members of the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. We will be bringing you those proceedings live here on KTN News. And uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has called for urgent talks uh, to avert a civil war in Burundi as uh, Bujumbura defended the actions of its security forces and rejected any idea of stationing tr uh, foreign troops on its soil. Well, Ban said uh, that he would send his special advisor Jamal Ben-Nomar to the region for talks with the Burundi government, other countries and uh, the African Union on ways to defuse the crisis that has spurred fears of a return to full-scale ethnic conflict in the worst clashes since a military coup was foiled in May. All insurgents attacked military camps in the capital Bujumbura on Friday and nearly 
people were killed in the ensuing violence. UN Human Rights Chief Zaid Ra'ad Al Hussein said on Tuesday the authorities had responded to the attacks with uh, house searches, arrests and alleged summary executions. The United Nations and the African Union have started preparing for the possible deployment of international peacekeepers in case the violence worsens. Violence in Burundi. What we have seen over the past few days is chilling. The country is on the brink of a civil war that risks engulfing the entire region. I have asked Mr. Jamal Benoma, my special advisor, to go to the region before the end of this week uh, to speak to the African Union, the countries in the region, and of course the government of Burundi. An inclusive political dialogue is needed urgently. We must do all we can to prevent the mass violence and act decisively uh, should it erupt. I want to move on to uh, the Kenyatta International Convention Center where our Abi again, of course, has been following up on uh, the WTO ministerial conference that has been happening there for the last uh, two days now. And uh, Abi, what is going to be happening there today? Uh, maybe you can just bring us up to speed with the latest from there. Many thanks there, Betty Okari. We are coming to you live from the Kenyatta International Convention Center, where the World Trade Organization Conference has entered its third day. Currently, we have the plenary session where various representatives drawn from the countries that are attending this particular conference are making their statements known. Of course, Kenya already made its position known yesterday when we had uh, the principal secretary in charge of foreign affairs, Dr. Karanja Kibicho, uh, make the statement for Kenya, indicating that Kenya was keen on seeing agricultural subsidies addressed as well as environmental goods. This was just a, pre a prelude, really, of what to expect. Today, a lot of negotiations are currently happening in the various uh, meeting rooms. The trade ministers, industrialization ministers, uh, trade experts are negotiating critical issues that would see Kenya and also Africa have a bigger voice on the global stage. We now want to get more perspectives from the Ghanaian trade and industrialization minister, Equus Pio Gabra. Welcome to KTN and let's just kick off the conversation for Ghana. What would be, what will you be looking forward to from this conference? Well, we're looking forward to a fair uh, multilateral trading system where developing countries in particular have as much opportunity to have access to the markets of industrialized countries as the industrialized countries have had access to our markets for centuries. As you know, they actually came and took over our countries for a couple of hundreds of years under the colonial system and did whatever they wanted with us in terms of our natural resources um, while extracting any raw materials that they could in any quantities that they wished and then exporting to us whatever their finished goods are. But well, with political independence over the last 50, 60 years, many African countries have been trying to take greater hold of their whole own economies. Mm -hmm. This has not been possible in many respects for a wide number of reasons that we will not get into over here. But the world trading system still remains um, quite unfair to the extent that industrialized countries subsidize significantly their agricultural products. I mean, the United States, who I used to serve as ambassador, along with the Kenyan uh, gentleman, Mr. Kip Corre, um, we found that the Americans were, you know, subsidizing their farmers with flood insurance and fire insurance and sometimes paying farmers for producing nothing at all for a particular year in order to you know monitor and to manage the output of maize and wheat and sugar and other crops in europe also subsidies continue to today uh, where the european union sometimes subsidizes each cow cow up to two euros a day so these are distortions in the global agricultural trade which in developing countries are asking the industrialized countries to address if they really want a fair and competitive global market. On one hand, they want our markets to be opened, liberalized, which they call trade facilitation, so that manufactured goods from industrialized countries can come into our countries much faster uh, to generate jobs in those countries and increase their revenues and to strengthen their economies. And at the same time, using sanitary and phytosanitary criteria for vegetables and agricultural produce from Africa, they often disqualify our 
produce from entering their markets. So I'm sure Kenyans and East Africans, just like West Africans, have experienced situations where certain products you've sent into European markets in particular, or US markets are quarantined and they're not allowed to enter the market because they say there are some insecticides or there are some chemical residues or whatever it is they want to find to prevent the goods from going in. And um, look, looking at um, this particular conference, uh, of course, issues of trade uh, continue to dominate the discussions here. We have currently intra-African trade starting at about 15%. Of course, if you look at the global trade, Africa is at a paltry 3%. As an African uh, representative attending this conference, what do you feel about this and what needs to change from this particular conference? Is it a talk shop or we will be seeing concrete solutions being arrived at? Well, this is not the, form, the forum really for African countries and African governments and businesses to address intra-African trade issues. This is a global conference, so there are Chinese and the Americans and Indians here. But when African trade ministers meet within the African Union or in other fora, then they can discuss pan-African issues. But in any case, we from Ghana, on the margins of this conference have presented and launched here the project called the Pan-African Trade Hub Systems, PATHS or PATHS, which is uh, an aggregation of e-procurement, e-commerce and e-payment platforms in Africa to allow African businesses, African governments, African entities to know where to procure various goods in quantity. These are bulk commodity goods, not so much on the consumer side. And so if uh, Malawi has a lot of uh, tobacco or, or tea or Kenya has a lot of flowers and vegetables they, they want to sell how does Gabon or a businessman in Nigeria find out about it? How does a Moroccan who has um, leather products or fertilizer to sell tell somebody in Botswana or Angola that these are the products I have and this is how much it costs? So this is a platform that we are taking advantage of based on the growth in the telecom sector in our respective countries the fiber optic cables that are now surrounding our continent, the satellite systems and wireless systems that we are all using to allow in PESA for example to do so well in East Africa and in Kenya the payment platforms that are now quite readily available and even the banking systems where we now have several Pan-African banks operating in 10, 15, 20 countries so the Stambiks of South Africa the Eco Banks from West Africa United, United Bank of Africa, Bank of Mali Many of these banks are now operating in 10, 15, 20 countries. So Africa has done many things to integrate its economy. There's a lot more to be done. But Kenya, which is flying to many countries in Africa, Ethiopian Airlines flies to many countries. South African Airlines does the same. And so through these shipping, airline, logistics, and cargo management systems, we hope through the PATHS project to support and strengthen inter African trade so that when we meet next time, whenever that is, we will not be talking about 2 3% of world trade, but maybe double, triple that and also not just 15% of African trade being amongst African countries, but 20, 25, 30%. So this is a commercial venture in which public agencies and private equity partners are going to be sought. We are expecting to get the full political support of Africa through the African Union heads of state meetings and the support of African Union Secretariat in Addis Ababa, and also the support of other Pan-African financial institutions like the African Export Import Bank based in Cairo, African Environment Bank based in Abidjan, African Reinsurance, based here right here in um, Nairobi, and a number of other Pan-African financial institutions, the ECOWAS Bank, the PTA Bank, mm -hmm. and so forth. So this is an initiative that Ghana has launched to get today with the support of Kenya, and we expect other African countries to come along in due course to enable us to have the platforms that allow us to do the real trading. Otherwise, we can talk about Pan-African trade at a theoretical level and sign many agreements amongst us but then there'll be no real infrastructure that permits our businessmen and even our governments who do a lot of procurements to procure from each other how soon are we likely to see this system coming up and um, what will be the trickle down effect to the ordinary citizens on the ground well eventually an ordinary citizen will also be able to buy any products if you want to buy chocolates in kenya you don't have to buy them from switzerland or brazils you can buy them from ghana or from Cote d'Ivoire. and if somebody wants to buy several bags of tea you know, for just a normal small enterprise in Nigeria, they could also buy it from any number of East African countries. So eventually people will buy their wines from North Africa or from South, South Africa rather than from Europe and other re regions of the world. So ordinary consumers will begin to feel this as well in due course. But these kind of systems take time because there are regulatory hurdles, there are policy hurdles, there are legislative harmonization that needs to be done in some countries. Sometimes there are technical barriers in terms of the technology, infrastructure itself, or payment system, blockages, and the cyber security concerns that one has to worry about anytime using information and communication technologies. So there's a lot of work to be done, but 
with the support of all these agencies that I'm talking about, we hope that by the time the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement is ready to be signed, hopefully in 2017 or soon thereafter, that the basic building blocks of this infrastructure system will also be in place. And of course, you can always improve it. So when you have a Google or your Yahoo or your Facebook, they, they launch it and then you find them improving and adding and modifying it with time. It's an ongoing process and it's a, a lifelong exercise. Many thanks there, EcoSPO Gabra, the Trade and Investment Minister, I beg your pardon, the Trade and Industry Minister from Ghana, indicating that they have launched a platform that seeks to integrate the African economies, which will see the level of trade go from the current 15% to higher margins. Of course, today we'll also be seeing the ascension of a few other countries to the WTO. Among the countries we are looking forward for today, we have Afghanistan and Kazakhstan that will be making uh, their, uh, their position known here as also they'll be accepted to the WTO family and uh, this brings us to uh, the end of our coverage for now but at 2 p.m. we will be coming to you live from here with my colleague Joy Dorian Bira to give you more perspectives on what's happening at this particular 10th Ministerial World Trade Organization Conference. My name is Abi Agina handing over to Betty Okari. Thank you so much, uh, Abby, for that interesting conversation. Of course, a lot of prospects uh, there from what he has been able to tell us. We want